Welcome birders, this is Ed Pullen, your host on the Bird Banter Podcast, where birders talk birding. My guest today is Doreen Anderson. On previous episodes, I've briefly introduced my guest, and we've been on with the episode. But Doreen has an academic background that's so interesting and so relevant to his story that I want to present that to you. Doreen grew up in Philadelphia, cut his birding teeth in the Delaware Valley, went to several Victor Emanuel youth birding camps, went away to Connecticut to boarding school for high school, got his undergraduate degree at Stanford in cellular biology, got his PhD in New York at NYU, and then did postdoctoral work in Boston at Harvard and the Mass General Hospital. He was on the fast track to a high-powered academic career. Dorian burst on the birding scene in 2014 when he walked away from that academic career to do a birding big year. The difference was, he did his birding big year on a bicycle. A lot of you may have followed that birding big year on his blog. I sure did. But today you'll hear not only that story, but the beginning of the rest of the story. Welcome, Dorian. Thanks a lot, Ed. It's great to be here, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's it's always funny to hear my scientific credentials read back to me as I am now involved in, in science in absolutely zero capacity. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Birding is sort of, you know, eBird is citizen science, you know. That is, that is very <laughs> it's not true, zero. My, it's it's a little lower than where you were. My reductionist training is like just sitting on a shelf, like waiting to be dusted off at the moment. So <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be back in, in a laboratory capacity. I'm actually hoping not. But it's, yeah. Well, you it's know, you, you've got it in, in the bank. You know, it's in the bank. You can go there if you need to. <laughs> Yeah, it, it lends credibility, if nothing else. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So, Doreen, I'm going to ask you to begin by just sort of telling me about how you got started in birding, your youth, and, and just a little uh, background of birding for you. Yeah, so I am, uh, I didn't really, <clears throat> birding was something that was completely self-discovered. Neither one of my parents is, is a birder, and neither one is into the outdoors at all. Uh, my mom does a bit of gardening, but my dad and 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 mom are much more into museums and dining and history and that kind of stuff. So they're not really into the out of doors. So I discovered birding on my own cool. um, at around six or seven years old. Okay. Uh, I lived downtown in Philadelphia for the first six or seven years of my life. And then we moved to a more suburban area in the city. So I went from having no yard, no outdoor space to having an actual yard when I was seven years old. And all of a sudden, uh, Blue Jays and Cardinals and Robins and Woodpeckers registered right at that most impressionable age. Sure. And Did you have a feeder? Or? Yeah, so we had a feeder. My mom actually bought a feeder. My dad hung it right outside our window. And my mom made an effort to plant <clears throat> bird-friendly plants in the yard. And so I ended up spending a lot of time just kind of kicking around my own yard. <laughs> the other thing that was funny is that the commuter train, the SEPTA commuter train, ran mm-hmm. right through my backyard. <laughs> and so I split my time pretty evenly as a kid throwing rocks at the train and then looking for birds in between the in between episodes in between the trains so i'd have to like i'd have to kill 45 minutes between the trains so i'd go and look at birds and then if sure. you the train come in, i'd go throw more rocks at it so that was my life <laughs> from like age age seven through 15 Hope, hopefully you didn't have too good an arm <laughs> unfortunately i did and i also threw fruit and all sorts of other stuff so it was a disaster nothing bad ever happened but it was just like one of these one of these things that I remember from my childhood of, of throwing lots of trains and, and birding in the backyard. It was really it was a, it was a wonderful experience growing up. Yeah, very nice. Um, very nice. And you mentioned the you, you mentioned the vent camps. Those were those are really instrumental in kind of connecting me to other young birders. My birding mentor in Philadelphia was actually Robert Ridgely, the renowned South American ornament. Oh yeah, and he. He and I met through my mom and his wife, who were in a gardening club together. Um, so I birded with him a lot through my teen years, um, and then did the Victor camps. And then the interest took a took a big hit when I went to boarding school because yeah. I had no transportation, yeah. and uh, and I was so and peer pressure to not bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too bad there. It wasn't okay, too bad there. But I just got, I just got into into other things. Like sure. I was so Hotchkiss is one of these pressure cookers. It's that you just don't have time to do stuff that's not sure uh, academic, athletically, or, or kind of college motivated. Yeah, I, I went to Bowdoin there. College in, in Brunswick, Maine, and and there were a fair number of kids who who I went to college with who attended those sort of prep schools, and they are 
all consuming sort of endeavors, you know, I mean, between yeah. academics and social stuff and sports and, you know, it's like going to college at age 15. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. But I mean, it's, you have four or five hours a night of, of homework and classes on Saturday. And it's interesting because a lot of people really like the boarding school model who end up there and they end up getting fed to places like Bowdoin and Williams and Amherst and Stanford. Um, and a lot of those small, <laughs> I was, it's funny. I was the only one in my class out of like 170 to go to Stanford. Oh, really? Like 15 go to Harvard, 15 go to Harvard, 15 go to Princeton, 15 go to Yale. And nobody goes out West. Everybody stays in the Northeast. Yeah. yeah. You broke away. You broke the mold. So, yeah, and it was great. I loved my time at Stanford. I didn't do much birding there, unfortunately, because I was drinking a lot of beer and spending a lot of time playing ultimate frisbee. Uh, so the, the interest really kind of got crushed through college. Uh, I'm pretty open about this. I'm actually an alcoholic. And oh, so, okay. Um, a lot of kind of my trajectory through my 20s was motivated by alcohol yeah. and partying and other kind of social pursuits. And then... It was when I kind of got sober that I ended up reconnecting with birding, and that is where the genesis for the 2014 Bicycle Big Year came. Oh, okay. It was kind of reclaiming some of these childhood dreams that alcohol and science to some degree, because I was so busy in my lab for those sure. 15 years, had, had stolen from me, so to speak. Um, so that's why the, the Big Year, it, it was kind of, it was as much a, a personal endeavor as it was a birding endeavor. And I thought the bicycle would be a really interesting vehicle, not only to explore physical space, but also to, to explore myself. Yeah. You, you were pretty open too. about that in your blog. I know I followed your blog. Uh, I discovered it boy early in January of 2014 and mm -hmm. boy, it was fascinating reading all year. It was, uh, it was great. Uh, I love that. But, uh, oh, thank you. but yeah, you were, I mean, it was, it was clear that, that, that there was some element of this big year that was, you know, restorative for you. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I think that also in the time looking back since, I've, since I got off the bicycle, thinking about uh, my motivations and kind of and, and trying to understand myself better, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a very long process through the bike trip and in the years that followed. And it's ongoing, and that's what makes it interesting. I think that the bicycle trip is kind of one of the pins on which my life will swing, um, kind of not only away from science, but towards a better understanding of myself, um, completely independently of birding. I mean, it was facilitated by birding. The analogy I give people is that the birds were, there's, there's children's pictures that the kids draw where they have numbered dots, and, and you connect right. the dots with the parent right. in, in the order, and eventually a, a picture of some fuzzy animal like a dog or a cat, or yeah. maybe a house emerges, and, and the birds were... The birds were those dots for me on my big year, but the picture that emerged wasn't of of a bird. It was of myself. Sure. And I'm still connecting those dots today. So yeah. There's, Hopefully there's we all are to some degree. Ongoing. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Life isn't static, and things change along the way. And For and sure. You, you, do, you, you, you deal with what cards you dealt, and you, you play the best hand you can. You know, I wouldn't be doing this pod podcast if it weren't for cards that have been dealt. My wife died about uh, just less than a year ago. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I've always been, and I retired from my medical practice a couple of years before that, worked a little bit, but mostly retired. You know, so I'd have a lot of time to spend with her, and we did a lot of travel and some cool stuff. But, and after she passed, I, you know, I just didn't have a passion. It was nothing I was, you know, mm -hmm. I, I birded, like kind of dove into birding as an escape. And, uh and and birded like crazy for the last few months. But, uh, yeah, I, I've always kind of been best when I've had a little bit of a hustle going, you know, a little bit of a little bit of, you know, a passion, something to get up in the morning and make sure I had something to do. And and uh, and thank you for being a part of my 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 recovery or my uh, restoration yeah, or whatever you want to call it, you know. And I'm sorry to hear about your wife. Yeah. Like, well, you know, you know life happens. And... Uh, but but. Uh, yeah, I think you met Kay at the, at the. I met you at the Rio Grande Birding Festival. That's right. I think it was a year. It was the fall exactly. after your big year, and uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had all sorts of uh, all sorts of unsolicited advice for you about your blog. Uh, <laughs> some, some of which I've actually taken. I saw I, that as I've kind of like as I move beyond the writing projects that I'm working on now, yeah. I'll have a bit more time to, to do some of the web development stuff that, that you suggested as well. Yeah. So yeah, that, you know, that, I think that's the thing. It's a you got to have these little projects, and I think that birding, beyond for some people, it can be a passion and an obsession, and for other people, it's, it's just a diversion. And for it's, sure, 
I always I always think of birding as like people play the lottery for a reason, right? There's there's an inherent amount of uncertainty built yes. into the process. Oh yeah. And people yeah. watch people watch sports for the same reason that there's this uncertainty built into the equation and people who don't bird don't understand that it's that inherent uncertainty that, that drives birding as well because you never know what you're going to find and as a result it is that that's what makes something birding. addicting you know if if you got the birding. exact anticipated result every time you did something it'd get boring but but you know exactly. things that you get really hooked on have that unpredictable wildly positive result <laughs> exactly and i think that in a world where there's a lot of routine and there's a lot of stress birding provides this this refuge of possibility against this backdrop of predictability. And exactly. I, I think that until people get to experience that for themselves, they don't really understand the allure of birding. Yeah. People can understand that we can appreciate birds for their aesthetic qualities and for their interesting behaviors and, and whatnot. But it's a bit more difficult to wrap your head around the process of birding yes. until you understand the idea of possibility yes, um, and how that connects to excitement and motivation. Exactly, exactly. I, I hadn't put it in words quite that way, but you're dead on. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> Obviously, you think deeper than I do. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, as I think that I've, these are the kind of things that I've been thinking a lot about as I've been writing this book and why it's been taking so long, because trying to not only do this, the kind of self-analysis and dissection, um, but also to, to kind of frame birding in a way that non-birders can understand it and can grasp it. And exactly. I, fishermen have the same problem. Like fishing isn't about catching fish. It's about a time the for possibility reflection. and the uh, possibility and, of catching a fish. Yeah. Exactly. Right. The dream of catching a fish and the dream is almost more important than the fish. For sure. And it's kind of the same thing in birding that you don't know what you're going to find. And because of that, you're motivated to go out again and again and again and again. And you appreciate the common stuff, but you're really in the back of your head hoping to see something different, whether it be a different behavior or something like a rarity. Or, or in your case, get the really good photograph or all sorts of different yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking of photography, if you, if you like good bird photography, check out Dorian Anderson. Is it DorianAndersonPhotography.com, I think? Yeah, it's dot .com, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Yeah. Anyway, Darren, let, let's get back to your biking big year a little bit. T tell me okay. <clears throat> how it started. I, I remember being so like, whoa, what a start. Yeah, that first day. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so I started, I, the rationale for starting in Massachusetts was that there are about 25 cold weather specialists, things like Longtail Duck and Northern Strike. And what else? Great snowy Palmer, owl, King Eider, <laughs> King Eider snowy owl, yeah, snow bunting, and all these sure. outfits that you can only get in the Northeast in the winter. And as I set the goal at 600 species, the only way I was going to get there was to visit the Northeast in the middle of the winter. And plus, so you I, lived I was there. In Boston. <laughs> plus, I lived there, so it made the logistics of starting there easy. I knew that I had to start there and end in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, so. I just figured I'd rather start in the cold and ride away from it than sure. ride into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was great. I mean, it, heading north from Florida in uh, November would have been discouraging. <laughs> no, and it, it would have been it would have been really really difficult, and I would have been pressed for time. The nice thing is is that the the cold weather because of the polar vortex in 2014, it was so cold that it limited what I could do, and I had 22 inches of snow on the second and third day, so I didn't oh even goodness. ride on those two days. Were they uh, using that term snowing. polar vortex then? I, I never heard that term till this year when I started talking about it. That that term has been popularized since 2014. Anytime you get these big stabs of Arctic air pushing south into into like the upper Midwest and northeastern United States, they this polar vortex. And I guess the theory is that as as you have more warm pockets of air because of global warming, yeah, those warm pockets of air de, uh, deform the polar air mass and then that air gets displaced southern south into into lower latitudes where where it's not supposed to yeah. be and Ob that's obviously things are more extreme now when I, I grew up in maine we call them a cold snap <laughs> yeah and but the thing is it's a cold snap in 2014 lasted for six weeks yeah i didn't have a temperature above 30 i didn't above 32 degrees for the first five weeks oh, and it snowed ouch. i had five or six different snowstorms, two of which dumped at least 14 inches, uh, had a lot of ice. So Any frostbite? Starting in the Northeast was a big gamble. Any frostbite? I didn't bite? get frostbite. Good for you. I didn't have any like frostbite, but my hands and feet were basically numb for the first month. Yeah. Um, it was really cold. I mean, even 
even moving into when I moved into D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, it snowed when I was in D.C. And yeah, you're expecting it to warmed up by then, yeah. Yeah, like I was expecting, okay, it's going to be cold till Philadelphia, but I'll get above freezing once I move south of there. And it, it really didn't get above freezing until I made it to North Carolina. Wow. And even as I moved down the East Coast, there was ice, there's a huge ice storm that went through Charleston, South Carolina when I was there. So oh it wasn't goodness. until I got into Florida that it really, the, the vortex loosened its grip on me. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, you had uh, some of your most challenging riding right off the get-go. Yeah, and the nice thing is that the, the inclement conditions kept my riding to a minimum. So, sure. And they forced days off. As an alcoholic, I'm not good at moderation, right? And so... Yeah. Everything is like 100 miles an hour for me. And so having the snow and weather force days where I physically could not ride actually helped me maintain my fitness base through the early part of the year right. and not burn out as the year progressed. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So the, the weather gods were with you. The weather gods were with you in yeah. a perverse sort of way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so you got to Florida. You got to Florida, and then that was, you know, it might not have been warm there, but at least it was a whole lot warmer than uh, below freezing. Yeah, it was nice. Florida worked out well. I ended up spending, I guess I got into Florida on February 22nd, and I probably spent the next month moving south through the peninsula. And, I mean, getting wintering birds like yellow throated warbler and those kind of southern, sure. some of those southern specialties and limpkins. And then really, once you get to the bottom quarter of the peninsula, it's really where it heats up. So then you get a bunch of the introduced exotics and yeah. white crowned pigeon. The Miami and stuff. Kite, those yeah. kind of things. Yeah, so I, I went to Miami, spent a few days there, and then rode across. My first 100-mile ride was actually across the peninsula on the Tamiami Trail. Oh, wow. So I rode from Miami to Marco Island. That was 111 miles in one day. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and then and, I moved north. Right, okay. Kind of up the coast, up the coast, there. and I actually was one of the last people to see Budger Gar. Um, oh, you I saw Budgie down there. I did. I actually got the last photograph of Budger Gar in the ABA area, according <laughs> to Bill Pranty, who's Isn't like that a funny? resident Florida expert. Isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah. I, I talked that bird on my. Uh, you know, a lot of us went back and entered our lifeless into into eBird, and I uh, mm -hmm. entered my uh, seven hundred and fifty budgies uh, in eBird. <laughs> that I saw probably in 1987 or something like that. And, uh, yeah, and, the, and the reviewer, the reviewer sent back said, what? I said, no kidding. They were just lined up on telephone wires for as far as you could see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's amazing to see how fast that decline happened. Yeah. So. And nobody, I mean, I don't say nobody cared, but it's not a native species. Yeah, it's it was. Not it's not like there was a big uh, move to rescue them. Sure. Yeah, exactly. It's just kind of people just watched it fall off the cliff and that was that, right? So... <laughs> Bit of a bummer, but that's the end of the, it's the end of the story as far as North American birders are concerned at this stage. Sure, um, sure. So I got that bird. Ended up. I also got a Lasagras flycatcher in Miami, which was a nice. Oh, bonus. nice. Yeah. I, I missed mangrove cuckoo, which is really. I, hard. I read about that. Uh, Gosh, I, it, it took me three trips to Florida to get that. So don't feel bad. I had a car, so don't feel bad about that. Yeah, and it helps to go later in the season. This is this is the problem is that. A regular big year birder can go everywhere at the optimal time. Exactly. The transition time is negligible, yeah. right? I had sure. one shot at Florida, and it, and it had to happen between the Northeast and Texas, and I couldn't go back. And so the cuckoos weren't very vocal, and I was I caged for them. Yeah. I thought a nesting season, hoping to get a response, and got yeah. nothing, so I didn't even get it as a herd bird. Sure, um, sure. I was I was uh, thinking the other day uh, about your big year, and you know your your big year is in a kind of a strange sort of way analogous to Noah Stryker's uh, world big year. You know, he made one contiguous loop, and and his goal was not so much to find all the rarities, but to find the common birds where they were common. You know, so in some way, you know. Yeah, yeah. There actually are a lot of similarities, and like we both experienced some degree of of diminishing returns, but. He was constantly changing geography, oh, yeah. Said, um, yeah. and I would always get like big bumps when I when I got to new areas. So I got a big bump exactly. when I got to southeastern Arizona, and I got sure. a big bump when I got to Pacific Northwest, and a, another even a final big bump right at the end of the year when I got to back, south, back to, to Texas, the yeah. Rio Grande Valley. Sure. So actually, I really liked the idea of Noah's big year. Yeah, it was it was, was great. In that, like that's I think that's the biggest difference is that when you can. The returns in a North American big year diminish so quickly. And yeah. I think that as you get further and further out on that asymptote, the effort and quite honestly the dollars per bird get so 
astronomically high that it's yeah. very difficult for to wrap our heads around the expense, the effort that have to go into getting those last sure. Uber. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah, to get to you know Atu and crazy places. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so your figure continued. You went across the south, the southern U.S. And I think you made a foray kind of up into uh, Colorado, didn't you? Yeah. So I spent. I went around the Gulf. I spent most of the spring going around the Gulf and in Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. so I spent two weeks on the Texas coast doing the whole yeah. high island neotropic migrant stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because that was again. I had to get all of those. Yeah, you weren't going to be in the east in the in the summer. In the you weren't going to get them on the breeding ground. Yeah. And I wasn't, and I wasn't going to get them as they went back south. So I had to get everything as they went north through Texas. So I was in Texas. I arrived on April 12th, and I left on April 27th. And then I rode across Texas, and that was ridiculously hard. Oh, I'm um, sure. I rode Interstate Interstate 10 almost all the way from Austin. Well, it did from all the way from Austin to southeastern Arizona. So it was like 800 miles. In the oh same my road. goodness! Yeah. Um, and then I spent a couple of weeks in southeastern Arizona, about two weeks there, and I left southeastern Arizona kind of at the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. middle of June, maybe. Right. <clears throat> and then kind of went north into southeastern Utah and southwestern Colorado and basically took refuge in the mountains for the summer. Uh, you could you can do a huge big year just doing like the Sun Belt of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, oh, yeah. Gulf, and Florida. But it's too hot to be down there in the summer. So I went up into the mountains instead. And Colorado was like the best riding of the whole year. I mean, oh. it was hard. I mean, I had the bike. Serious hills. I had the bike up. Over, yeah, I mean, it was... I had to bike over 12,000 feet a couple times oh and my did a lot of walking. So every time I went up to 10, 11, 12,000 feet above treeline, uh, I'd have to ditch the bike and take off my biking shoes and put on my hiking boots and then go walking to look for things like white-tailed ptarmigan and sure. brown-capped rosy finch and some of these other tundra specialties. So those birds were really difficult to get. Yeah, most of us uh, just go get those at a feeder in the winter. <laughs> and the grouse, the grouse were the same way. The grouse, like yeah, the, you were at you weren't there for the grouse. lex, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a normal big year birder can just drive up and be like ping, 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 get them, if not all in, in a week, maybe eight, ten days. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. But the grouse were these protracted battles of of walking through habitat, trying to flush them during the summer. So I sure. eventually got them all, but. Sage grouse took forever to get. Sage grouse took like eight or nine dedicated days. Oh, it, it, they are really hard when they're not on their lack. I mean, unpredictable. Yeah, they just, there's no, you, you can't plan on it. You just gotta, you gotta flush them. It's a brute force function, exactly. You have to, you have to walk enough miles and step within 20 feet of one for it to fly, because you're not going to see it if it doesn't fly. Exactly. Um, because this, the habitat's so thick. So yeah, I spent the summer in the Rockies, and then I actually did better than I thought I would in terms of pace. So I was originally planning on going kind of through south, southern Wyoming and then across southern Idaho and then into northeastern Oregon, and then to the Pacific Coast from there. But I was a lot stronger than I thought I would be, so I actually expanded my, my route all the way up to the Canadian border. I know you got up into my, my part of the woods. Yeah, and I got a bunch of cool stuff up there. I got spruce grouse I and saw oriole that. chickadee, which were two birds I had were not on my radar when I originally planned out the trip. Yeah, and man. I also got mugal and marbled murrelet, which were really easy up there. And mm -hmm. I would have actually been moving south along the Pacific coast uh, below those birds. Yeah. So I would have had a hard time getting those birds had I not gone up to Washington. I also got slady back gull. In that yeah, that was, that was right here in Tacoma. Tacoma. Yeah. I, yeah. You, met, you met one of my friends do it. I, I don't know if it's Bruce Labar. Or, I can't remember. I did. I met Bruce there. Okay. That was the first time I met Bruce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was like skulking around in there, and we met, and then I knocked into him again. Uh, were you on, on the repositioning cruise? Repo yeah. Cruises? Yeah, I, I, I saw yeah, you there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was where I saw him the second the second time. Kind of we pieced together that we had met at that Ladyback Gull. Exactly. This is the one thing about birding, right? Is that the birds end up connecting people and the birds just provide the motivation for it is a, it is a relatively stores. small community yeah yeah it's incest it's incestuous if we can use that yes word. i think you're right i think you're right <laughs> good so let, let's kind of cruise through the end of your big year quickly uh during yeah. you, you uh you went there you went down the coast of california picked up a whole bunch of cool stuff and then mm -hmm. and then i can't remember the route you took to get back to texas yeah, so I went by the Salton Sea and did a bit of birding there. Okay. And basically rode, 
rode Interstate 8 from there to Tucson and then got back on. And she did a little bit more birding south of Tucson to get Sinaloa Wren mm-hmm. and Baird Sparrow, which okay. winters there because I couldn't get it in the upper right. west. And then okay. went basically back onto I-10 and rode I-10 all the way back to central Texas and then cut south down to the Rio Grande Valley and spent a bunch of time down there, spent three weeks down there, got the red-legged honey creeper. I saw that. North American record. What a cool find. That was cool. Talk about the unexpected, the uh, wonderful find that we talked about at the beginning of this. Yeah. Yes. That was on Thanksgiving Day, and then we posted it to the, the Texas bird list or whatever it was, the Facebook group, and people were, like, coming to Estereana Grande with turkey in hand and, like, plates of mashed potatoes. <laughs> because they had like left their Thanksgiving dinner and they brought their food with them. So it was a lot of fun. Very They're cool. Stuck around for three days. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of picked up the usual hook-billed kites and Prudence pygmies and Appalachian meadow falcons, and then rode up the coast and spent another two weeks kind of going up towards Dallas and got Smith's longspur and little gull on, on a lake outside of Dallas. Oh, nice. The That's a good and one. At that stage, I was at I was at 615, and then I could retroactively count Muscovy and. The domestic Muscovy that I saw in Florida. Right. I didn't see a wild one in Texas. Yeah. And also Egyptian goose, which was made countable that year. Uh-huh. And then the honey creeper, which was made countable a year and a half later. That got accepted finally. That, yeah. Yeah, it took a while, but uh, that was what I ended up with. It was 618. It was 17,800 miles or something. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, a, a <laughs> wonderful, a wonderful big year and a wonderful story, Dorian. So yeah, you've sort of transitioned it sounds like, uh, since then, into a more photography-based uh, birding. Uh, you had mentioned that to me. Yeah, so I, I love bird listing and I love the collecting aspect of it, but I, I've also started to see that pure birding for me doesn't necessarily hold the same allure as photography. And so I've kind of continued to juggle the two interests. Uh, and photography becoming more and more part of what I do. The big thing is that I don't bird, I don't drive to bird anymore. I do all of my birding from my bike. I didn't when I lived in LA for the two years following my yeah. visit. LA was such a biking disaster. <laughs> but since moving to the Bay Area, I do all of my birding from my bike, and I find I find driving to go birding very unsatisfying. Hmm. Um, I really like having to strategize and work to think about how I'm going to go see what on my bike. Uh-huh. And so when I'm not doing that, um, so what I end up doing is I end up riding my bike around when it's gray and cloudy and the light is flat and I don't want to shoot. But on the days when the sun is out, I'm out with my camera and I have one of these huge 600 millimeter Mongo lenses. Mongo suckers, yeah. You can't really ride on a bike with. So uh, I've just found that photography has, is wonderful and that it slows you down to a degree that even bird, even even birding doesn't. Like birding slows you down compared to real life. And then photography slows you down even more because most of my, the shots that I'm looking for, I'm at a position now where I have an idea of the shot that I want and, and I kind of design the image ahead of time. And I say, I want this bird doing this. How can I go and get that? And so if that's a sandpiper flying by, I have to find a place where the bird's going to fly by. I have to study the timetable to get the light right and really understand the behavior as these birds are going to be moving across a mud flat, when they're going to fly versus when they're going to walk. And I really found it satisfying i've learned much more from behavior from photography than i have from birding actually because i I have to put so much focus on on an individual species and often an individual within that individual species in order to in order to capture the shots that i'm looking for sure what's kind of the the two-pronged approach is the bike is one is how i do my birding and the camera is the other thing yeah sounds like you've actually done some uh south american or central american uh birding safari, photography safari sort of trips. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm moving into now. As I still have a fair amount of writing to do on this book, but like that project is, is hopefully going to be closed this year, knock on wood. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward I'm working, to it. Yeah, I know. I, I'm hoping that it's like even, even if I finish the writing, I think it's going to take another six months. Um, but then it takes another six months to make – even if they, if you have a book contract, it takes them another six months to actually physically get the book together. So it's sure. going to be a while. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. I've been, I've been working with Alvaro Jaramillo here in, in the Bay Area, the Alvaro's Adventure. Most of anybody who's into gulls knows Alvaro, and he's pretty well known in the birding community. He wrote the Field Guide to Chile. It's just it's one of these big personalities in the birding community. But uh-huh. I'm going to be leading tours for him. So I'm taking a group to Colombia. Uh, this summer, it's built as like a photo birding trip. So the idea is that 
it's a traditional birding trip, but there's going to be a bit more. Um, we're going to include a couple of places where people can actually do some photography, like at these setups, these feeder lines, or and I'll be available for photographic consultation. So I don't necessarily, I'm not going to lead the kind of photo trips where people could be sitting in a blind all day because I want to go birding. Sure, I, I want to be able to balance birding and photography. So. Uh, but the plan is to do more of these and also to lead some traditional birding tours for Alvaro. So we're talking about trying to do a Cuba trip in December and we're working on Guatemala for next spring and Taiwan for next spring. So wow. uh, Exciting. the idea is to kind of, as, as the book kind of winds down, to then transition into, into doing some guiding. I don't want to be a full-time bird guide. Um, not only is that not what I, what I want to focus on, but... Uh, I don't think my wife wants me gone six months of the year. Yeah, that's um, a tough, uh, tough lifestyle on families. That is for sure. But I say, I say, if I could do like six or seven, ten to twelve day trips a year, that would be perfect because that would allow me to kind of share my passion with other people, but also leave me the time to do some more writing and also to do some more advocacy. And I have some other kind of pet projects I'd like to. I'd like to work on moving forward. The project with the Audubon Society in Colombia this year was awesome. I spent yeah, seven tell, weeks tell me about that. How did, what was that all about? Yeah, so I, I got invited. People figured out that I could that I could photograph and write from my blog, and so a bunch of doors opened up because of that. And I've been able to go on a bunch of these kind of government and tourism ministry sponsored trips to various countries to help them promote ecotourism within their individual countries. So I did one in Taiwan and one in Spain, mm -hmm. Belize, Guatemala, and I actually ended up in, in two in Colombia with the Audubon Society. Um, this the is Audubon a, Society a, a, with the them. United States Audubon Society? or it's... Yeah, so the, you, the Audubon Society in the States is working with the Colombian government and a couple of other Colombian conservation entities oh, okay. to promote birding as, as a sustainable means of economic development sure. in a recently stabilized country. And so if a, if a family has a, has a parcel of land that holds several Colombian endemics, it's better to get them to help them develop ecotourism than just have them sell that plot to a, an oil company who's immediately going to clear cut it and destroy it. Like, yeah. That's not sustainable. And so what I've been helping, what I was helping them do this summer was go around to a lot of, kind of small areas. They're thinking about uh, that landowners are hoping to develop as private reserves effectively. And helping these people not only kind of expose their properties, but also giving them suggestions as to what they can do to attract foreign birders to their properties. And so what I was able to do then was suggest a series of itineraries through different regions of the country uh, that are kind of generic templates that Audubon offers to foreign birders, mostly American birders on their mm -hmm. own website, uh, that people can then modify depending upon what the goals of their trip are. So sure. I say, these sites are particularly good for endemics. These sites are particularly good for photography. Right. This site is this site is really good, has great birding, but it requires a lot of walking. So this is a great site for adventurous birders. This is a great site sure. for uh, mobility limited birders. And kind of people can use these generic itineraries to, to tailor their own, either tour companies can use it or individuals, their own, very, very cool. Columbia. And and a lot of these countries, I just took a trip to Guatemala where I, I uh, Claudia, uh, Claudia uh, Ar Arandaro, I think is her last name, uh, I used mm -hmm. as a guide. And uh, she is developing a, a huge network of local guides, you know, people who just live in a town. And if you're there, you can get a hold of them and they know the trails and the birds and which places are safe and which places aren't safe and just fabulous resources is is that been a part of this too the developing local yeah. local uh birding guide resources yes yeah, so audubon has actually spearheaded guide training in colombia they've done this in the bahamas they've done this in guatemala very cool uh, they've done it in a number of countries now and so they have these guide academies where people can come and take a course and learn not just the birds but also kind of how the guiding industry works, right. how you promote yourself, um, everything from group management and, and these sorts of things. Sure. So, uh, it's a really cool project. It'll be interesting to see uh, how it plays out in Colombia. I think that, I mean, the country has more species of birds. It has 1,900 species. Yeah, it's got you more can... species than any other country. Yeah. And it's... Rock, jump, find, Rock I, Jumper has I, that 1,000 birds in a month trip you can take. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's crazy. It's great. And I find Columbia safer than the U.S. I mean, I slept in unlocked barns and rural farmhouses and with my camera, and I didn't worry about it. Like, I wouldn't sleep 
in in the U.S. in a Motel 6 with my door wide open, and I did that in Colombia. Sure. So the the security concerns are, I don't want to say a non-issue, but... The, they're certainly a different like issue. They're else. certainly a different issue. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like everywhere else, you have to, you know, have a general feel of what's safe and what's not safe. But uh, I, I agree. My travel in Central America has been, I've never been frightened. Yeah, you know, it's, People are friendly. There's a language barrier, but I speak enough Spanish to kind of fake my way around. Um, so it works out. But Good. it's been great. I mean, I've, I really, I think that that's another shift that's happened is that, I mean, I think that a lot of, there's a huge focus on, on the ABA list for a lot of North American birders. But I think that as soon as you start birding outside of the U.S., I mean, my mindset is, why would, is now, why would I fly somewhere to go see two birds from my ABA list? when I can go to Peru for the same price for two weeks. And see 800 800 birds. (laughs) Exactly. So once I started birding outside of the U.S., my ABA list started to mean a whole lot less. I mean, I still still like it. Sure. We've got a pretty good one. Building it up. But (laughs) yeah, it's still, I hang it in there. I mean, I haven't been to Alaska yet. So, oh gosh! There's still a ton of birds waiting for me there, but like Attu is a place I don't think I'll ever go. I yeah, mean, you know the I I, I, I just talked to a Christian Hagenlocker last week, and yeah, there are yeah. two spaces on the Attu trip. <laughs> yeah, the space isn't the issue; it's the ten thousand bucks to do it, right? Like, that and spending so. you know, sixteen days on a seventy-two foot boat in the in the Bering Sea. Yeah. Hey man, I spent three hundred sixty-five days on a bike. I'm the most. I have the highest misery threshold of any birder in the world. I'm almost willing to stake my life on that. Yeah, so, I, I don't doubt that you're right. But a boat. <laughs> I don't know. I, no my, my misery threshold is not that high. I get seasick. I don't know. That just seems like I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, don't I, know. All these trips. I lead all these pelagic trips for Alvaro here on the West Coast and also for Monterey Seabird. So I spend so much time on the ocean that I'm used to getting bounced around even when it's really rough. So I, yeah. I got the sea legs down. Yeah. Good. You got your biking biking seat and your sea legs. You're you're just going to be made of steel pretty soon here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, my wife keeps hoping I'm going to slow down, and I don't. So it's kind of like I have all this energy, and she's wondering, like, oh, when is when is this going to get tempered? And I keep telling her, I don't know, honey. I don't think, I don't think it ever is. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you've got a book in your future. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, what's coming yeah, up for you? What, what's what's uh, you know what's the next uh, month, year, several years hold for you? Do you or do you have a yeah. do you have a crystal ball? Yeah. So uh, on I guess today's Monday on two nights. Well, I leave to New Zealand. My wife and I are going there for just a vacation for for two and a half weeks. So I've been before, but I didn't do much but party that first trip. So I kind of wasted the experience. Yeah. Uh, so this will be a bit of redemption. Uh, my wife is super cool. She works for Airbnb. So oh, nice. between Airbnb and camping, we're just going to like totally rough it and keep it low key the whole time. We're going to move around a lot. You'll bring your binos uh, and a back, camera, I'm sure. Yeah, I've got my rig. I mean, I'll take my 600 millimeter lens and my 100, 400 and two bodies. So I have like a ton of camera equipment. An extra, su- that's, then, that's your carry on suitcase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're pretty cool, actually. I mean, it, it, it's always over the weight limit. They don't weigh the bag, but the, the few times they've tried to force me to check it, I've opened the bag up and been like, if you guys want to sign off on this equipment, we can check this. But I don't think you do. And they always have said, okay, we'll just put it with the captain's stuff if there's, like, no room in overhead bins or anything because mm-hmm. they realize that yeah. they drop They, they don't want to pay for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I come back from that, and i got 10 weeks around here. I'm actually going to give a talk in Alabama, which will be fun, because that'll be the first time back to Alabama since my big year. Uh, and then I do the Columbia photo birding thing in, in June and July, and I'll probably hang around in Columbia and see some friends down there for a week after that. Sure. And then summer, I'll hopefully knock out the writing at the end of, that, end of the summer. And then I'll have all the fall pelagics here on the West Coast, so I'll be doing a lot of those. I'm actually going to run a few of those uh, – for Alvaro when he's gone. Oh, so nice. Kind of having a more, act, a more active hand, not just like as a spotter, but actually running some of those trips. Okay. And then beyond this, like I, I think the big question for me is kind of what, what happens with me professionally. Sure. Uh, I think that my wife, I'm, I'm really fortunate. My wife has a killer job. Um, and with so, only, with only a dog in our foreseeable future, the dependent um, life, we have a lot of flexibility. And yeah. so, She's been super supportive of me trying to do this kind of writing birding thing. But I think ultimately my ultimate goal is to get back on the bicycle and 
used the bicycle to build international community. So one of the projects I've been discussing, I don't know if this will come to fruition. I have to obviously finish this book and kind of close the chapter on this before I can start the next part. I'd like to ride my bike from Mexico to Panama um, wow. and spend six to eight weeks blogging and doing some video and, and talking about sustainable economic development and meeting local people. I mean, I think that there has been some, some obvious demonization of anybody Latino in this country. And I think that's awful. And I think it would be isn't a really it, cool project. Doesn't to, it make you sick? To, oh, God, I just... Yeah, it's ridiculous, right? So it would be really cool to take the bike down there and ride my bike around Latin America, or at least Central America, and show people, like, these places are friendly. The people have the same problems that we have. And, and really, the bicycle it is such a leveling influence because it's, it's so basic. And everybody, every kid in the world has, like, ridden a bicycle at some point yeah. in his or her yeah. life. And, and you know, it, it's hard to hate people you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. And if you're familiar with people and and they take care of you, and you trust them, and they trust you, then you can build community. And so in an ideal world, I'd like to be able to take my bike to different points on the planet, maybe once each year for six to eight weeks. My wife has signed off on this already, so that's the biggest hurdle. That's a big one, and yeah. And go and, ex go and experience these places from my bicycle and then use that as a window to blog. And then if I had the energy after this book to write, to write more books, um, kind of – just kind of use the bicycle as a vehicle to explore the world and, cool. and do some birding along the way. So that's kind of where I'd like to go. I mean, I don't know. And a lot of what I, my future will be dependent upon what happens to this book. If my mom buys it, then I'm not a writer. If a few more people, well, I'll buy it, one. I promise. <laughs> there's two. There we that's go. two. You got two. Uh, you got two. So anyway, I'm uh, kind of like, Duran, we'll have you, we'll have you back on when your book comes out. Okay. We'll have you back on yeah, when your book comes great. out. And by then, hopefully, somebody will be listening to this, and uh, and you'll get to push your book there's a little bit. Now. Yeah. Don't sell yourself short. There's people listening now. There's throngs of birders out there. I know there are, and uh, and I'm hoping that uh, having a famous guest like you on the show will help. <laughs> oh well, you're too kind. Anyway, Dorian, uh, I, I want to give you a chance to shut out anything. How, how can people uh, find you if they need to find you online? You can find anybody these days. But what are good ways to get a hold of you? I actually have this like signal. It's like the bat signal that I can like project up into the sky. Perfect. So Perfect. I'll make I sure am. I go out. But there's too many clouds around <laughs> here, Dorian. The, the clouds here yeah. will make that not work. So it, it maybe something else. Yeah, the, best, the easiest thing to do is to get in touch. And my blog is The Speckled Hatchback, and I write about my travels there and also some local birding stuff. And just I put up a lot of my photography. So The Speckled Hatchback. Okay, I'll, blog, I'll make sure all these are in the podcast notes. So, And my, my email is just thespeckledhatchback at gmail.com. Um, and then the other thing, my, I have my photography website and my contact information is linked off of there as well. That's just dorianandersonphotography.com. Perfect. And for those of you on Instagram, I spend a lot of time on Instagram. I'm really active there. So my Instagram account is Dorian underscore Anderson underscore photography. Perfect. Um, and it's obviously so all at, of these, yeah. All of, all of these things are, are like cross-referenced. And at your suggestion, once the book is done, what's going to happen is that since I've already registered DorianAnderson.com. Good I for you. All of these. All of these arms, I'm paying. I'm paying for it, like the ten bucks a year or whatever, just to keep it registered. But once I have the book done, then all of these various arms will be centralized off of that. But I'm not quite there yet. Perfect. So. Perfect. Well, Dorian, yeah. thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been really fun to catch up with you. Uh, I've met you two or three times here and there, and every time it's like this bundle of energy and glowing person of joy. It's fun to see you. And I think a little bit of that came across today. So I'm excited about well, that. Thanks, and, uh, and, yeah, it's always, uh, always fun. Yeah, good. Doreen, thank you so much. Uh, Doreen Anderson has been my guest on the Bird Bander podcast, episode number five. Uh, be sure to follow uh, and subscribe to this. You can find it on the iTunes store, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast feeds from. And uh, Doreen, again, thank you so much. Uh, Nice talking to you. Yeah, cheers, Ed. Enjoy Southern California next week. Yes. Bye-bye. So if you enjoyed this episode of the Bird Banner Podcast, leave a five-star rating and write a review on the iTunes Store, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast feeds. Those efforts on your part will help me continue to get really strong guests. I'm looking forward to it. Good birding.
Good day.